for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Pause. Welcome to Southpaws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. I'm Darren Gibson, your host today. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the representative out of New York City, has introduced articles of impeachment against Supreme Court Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. We'll see how far she's able to get with those. We'll talk about that story. We have to talk about, I wanted to get to this last week and we ran out of time, but we need to put Tractor Supply Company into the douchebag of the week category because they have gotten rid of DEI and a bunch of other things because they've caved into the conservatives, the evil, violent, conservative traitors. So we'll talk about that. Great news out of France. The leftist party won the election. They they got first place. There's not enough uh, seats, though, unfortunately, to control the government. So what's next? We'll tell you what might happen next. Plus, we have to talk about a bunch of other topics here, including going back to last week. But let's right now tell you how you can follow us on social media. You can do so on Facebook by going to facebook.com forward slash South Paws Radio Show. You can follow us on X at South Paws Radio. You can follow us on Tumblr at South Paws Radio Show dot dot com. You can follow us on YouTube and Mastodon by doing a search for South Paws Radio. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash South Paws Radio. You can listen to the show anytime at Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Podcast Addict, Podvine, and Pandora by doing a search for South Paws. Once you found our logo, you found us. We send links to our weekly episodes to our Facebook, X, Tumblr, YouTube, and Mastodon accounts. You can listen to us on Global Community Radio Channel 1 every Saturday night at 11 Eastern. And you can listen to us on great Pacifica stations, including KCEI in Taos, New Mexico, KZGM in Kabul, Missouri, and KEPJ in San Antonio, Texas. So be sure to listen to us on your local Pacifica affiliate. We are recording the show on Thursday, July 11th, 2024. Before we get into today's topics, I want to go back to something that we talked about last week. And that was Project 2025 and the one of the architects of it saying that this is going to be the second American revolution if the left allows it to happen. In other words, saying that the leftists are going to get violent if they try to enact Project 2025, which I would be for. I'm sorry, I would. You have to fight for your rights, folks. You really do. You have to stand up to fascism every single day. But here's something that I thought about after the show last week. For the last 40 years, since the days of Ronald Reagan, anybody on the left has been referred to as wishy-washy, maybe pamby, limp-wristed, you know, weak, they, you name it, they said it about uh, anybody on the left. Liberals are wishy-washy, limp-wristed, you know, whatever. So how can we now be violent when we are also wishy-washy and limp-wristed and all that good stuff? Sorry, it can't be both ways. It has to be one or the other. So the question now is, when did this change? When did liberals become more violent in the words of conservatives? The, the maggots especially, maggots. Let's see, would that have happened in the 90s, the 2000s, and they just lied about it? Is it happening now, and they're lying about it? Yeah, I would say that it's they're lying about it right now because we haven't seen much resistance. We haven't seen much in the way of any protest when Oklahoma is making teachers teach the Bible starting this semester in the classroom. 
when Louisiana is telling schools you must post the Ten Commandments and it must be in a font size that's readable and it must be displayed in every classroom and da 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 Where were the protests then? There were none. None that I've heard about in the news. So it can't be both ways. Leftists, liberals, whatever you want to call it, progressives, can't be wishy-washy and violent at the same time. It's impossible. It's one or the other. So once again, conservatives lying about the left. Isn't that a surprise? Well, like I said, they just need to figure it out one way or the other. We're either one way or the other. We, you, you can't have it both ways. It's impossible. So I don't know. It's just absolutely insane, some of the stuff that comes out of the mouths of maggots. It really is, folks. It's crazy. It's insane. It's insanity. But like I said, for those of you that think the the left will just let things happen, you might want to think again. Might want to think that over. Because I won't. I won't let things happen like that. Not on my watch. You can say whatever you want. Oh, you shouldn't be threatening violence. And No, sometimes you need to. Instead of just threatening, I I just will just say a phrase that somebody famous once said, don't sing it, bring it. There's my comment on that. Just thought you'd want to know a thought that crossed my mind after last week's show. All right, right now let's go to our first story here. This is Ryan Nobles and Alexandra Marquez and Zoe Richards writing for NBC News. This is dated July 10th. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Democrat of New York, introduced articles of impeachment Wednesday against Supreme Court Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito over their refusal to recuse themselves from certain cases. Arguing that the two justices posed a threat to the rule of law, Ocasio-Cortez said on the House floor, quote, absent resignation, they must be removed. Because Valido's and Thomas's refusals to recuse, everyday Americans cannot, should not, and will not believe that these justices, and consequently the court they serve, is working to uphold the Constitution and put the country ahead of their own individual self-interest. End of quote. She added, quote, Reasonable Americans will and do believe that Justices Thomas and Alito are prone and subject to corruption, that the institution failing to punish them is broken, and that consequently their impeachment is a constitutional imperative and our congressional duty, end of quote. Ocasio-Cortez said that both justices had demonstrated, quote, a years-long pattern of misconduct and failure to recuse in cases bearing their clear personal and financial involvement, end of quote. That, she said, quote, represents an abuse of power and threat to our democracy fundamentally incompatible with continued service on our nation's highest court, end of quote. The Supreme Court did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the introduction of impeachment articles. The resolutions were co-sponsored by Representatives Barbara Lee, Democrat of California, Rashida Tlaib, Democrat of Michigan, once again on the correct side of the issue, Bonnie Watson Coleman, Democrat of New Jersey, Delia Ramirez, Democrat of Illinois, Maxwell Frost, Democrat of Florida, Ilhan Omar, Democrat of Minnesota, and Jamal Bowman, Democrat of New York. And unfortunately, uh, Bowman will not get reelected. He was primaried out of office by a centrist Democrat, somebody that supports Israel blindly. The first charge centers on two controversial flags that were flown outside Alito's homes, an upside-down American flag and an appeal-to-heaven flag. Both have been carried in recent years by members of the Stop the Steal movement whose supporters claim President Joe Biden did not lawfully win the 2020 presidential election. Alito has said it was his wife's decision to fly the flags. Alito declined to recuse himself from two Trump-related cases that were pending before the court when the existence of the flags was first reported. By the way, the Washington Post apparently had this story three years ago and failed to publish it. They decided not to. So a ban on the Washington Post for suppressing the First Amendment. The second charge against Alito appears to refer to his relationship with hedge fund billionaire Paul Singer, who ProPublica reported took Alito on a fishing trip to Alaska that Alito did not disclose in ethics reports. Alito later did not recuse himself from cases involving Singer. 
Thomas's impeachment article centers on his failure to disclose financial income, gifts and reimbursements, property interests, liabilities and transactions, among other information, refusal to recuse from matters concerning his spouse's legal interest in cases before the court, and refusal to recuse from matters involving his spouse's financial interest in cases before the court. Thomas's relationship with GOP megadonor Harlan Crow have been the subject of intense scrutiny for months. Extensive reporting last year by ProPublica showed that Thomas has accepted lavish gifts like vacations and flights without disclosing them on official ethics forums. Thomas has also drawn ire from critics over the conservative political activism of his wife Ginny Thomas, particularly her role in former President Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election in Arizona. That's going to be the only time we refer to Trump as former president on this show because we normally don't do that. Doesn't deserve it. In the aftermath of the election, Ginny Thomas also sent messages urging then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows to stand with Trump. She later said she regretted sending those texts. Still, Democrats called on Clarence Thomas to recuse himself from two cases involving Trump, a constitutional challenge to his re-election candidacy, and his presidential immunity claims. Thomas did not recuse himself from either case. Both were wins for Trump. He did recuse himself from a separate January 6th-related case in October. So there you go. Clarence Thomas has accepted millions of dollars of gifts over the last couple of decades. Doesn't report it, doesn't do anything. He needs to go. Mr. Pubic hair on the Coke can needs to go. Yes, I believe Anita Hill. I don't believe Clarence Thomas. He's a Republican. He's conservative. Conservatives lie. Noted liars. Donald Trump. And the representative that used to be out of New York but was uh, thrown out of Congress, uh, George Santos. <laughs> both noted liars, both conservatives. There you go, folks. I, I'm just going to make everything simple, nice and simple. You don't have to be following a long path. You just take it nice and easy. It's simple. Republicans lie, period, end of story. All right, let's get to our next story here. This one is scary as hell in my eyes. This is Kimberly Chandler writing for the Associated Press. This is dated July 9th out of Montgomery, Alabama. Listen to this. A company has installed computerized vending machines to sell ammunition in grocery stores in Alabama, Oklahoma, and Texas, allowing patrons to pick up bullets along with a gallon of milk. American Rounds said their machines use an identification scanner and facial recognition software to verify the purchaser's age and are as quick and easy to use as a computer tablet. But advocates worry that selling bullets out of vending machines will lead to more shootings in the U.S. where gun violence killed at least 33 people on Independence Day alone. The company maintains the age verification technology means that the transactions are secure, or more secure than online sales, which may not require the purchaser to submit proof of age or at retail stores where there is a risk of shoplifting. CEO Grant Magger said, quote, I'm very thankful for those who are taking the time to get to know us and not just making assumptions about what we're about. We are very pro-Second Amendment, but we are for responsible gun ownership, and we hope we're improving the environment for the community, end of quote. There have been 15 mass killings involving a firearm so far in 2024 compared to 39 in 2023. That's according to a database maintained in a partnership of the Associated Press, USA Today, and Northeastern University. Nick Suplina, Senior Vice President for Law and Policy at Every Town for Gun Safety, said, quote, Innovations that make ammunition sales more secure via facial recognition, age verification, and the tracking of serial sales are promising safety measures that belong in gun stores, not in the place where you buy your kids' milk. In a country awash in guns and ammo, where guns are the leading cause of deaths for kids, we don't need to further normalize the sale and promotion of these products, end of quote. Magger said grocery stores and others approached the Texas-based company, which began in 2023, about the idea of selling ammunition through automated technology. The company has one machine in Alabama, four in Oklahoma, and one in Texas, 
with plans for another in Texas and one in Colorado in the coming weeks. That, again, according to Maggers. He said, quote, People, I think, got shocked when they thought about the idea of selling ammo at a grocery store. But as we explained, how is that any different than Walmart? End of quote. Federal law requires a person be 18 to buy shotgun and rifle ammunition and 21 to buy handgun ammunition. Magger said their machines require a purchaser to be at least 21. The machine works by requiring a customer to scan their driver's license to validate that they are age 21 or older. The scan also checks that it is a valid license, he said. Uh, He added that that is followed by a facial recognition scan to verify, quote, you are who you are saying you are as a consumer, end of quote. He added, quote, at any point you can complete your transaction of your product and you're off and going. The whole experience takes a minute and a half once you are familiar with the machine, end of quote. The vending machine is another method of sale joining retail stores and online retailers. A March report by Every Town for Gun Safety found that several major online ammunition retailers did not appear to verify their customers' ages despite requirements. Last year, an online retailer settled a lawsuit brought by families of those killed and injured in a 2018 Texas high school shooting. The family said the 17-year-old shooter was able to buy ammunition from the retailer who failed to verify his age. Vending machines for bullets or other age-restricted materials is not an entirely new idea. Companies have developed similar technology to sell alcoholic beverages. A company has marketed automated kiosks to sell cannabis products and dispensaries in states where marijuana is legal. A Pennsylvania police officer created a company about 12 years ago that places bullet vending machines in private gun clubs and ranges as a convenience for patrons. Those machines do not have the age verification mechanism, but are only placed in locations with an age requirement to enter. That's according to Master Ammo owner Sam Piccanini. Piccanini spoke with a company years ago about incorporating the artificial intelligence technology to verify a purchaser's age and identity, but at the time it was cost prohibited. For American Rounds, one machine had to be removed from a site in Tuscaloosa, Alabama because of disappointing sales, according to Maggers. Maggers said much of the early interest for the machines has been in rural communities where there may be few retailers that sell ammunition. The American Rounds machines are in Super C-Mart and Fresh Value grocery stores in small cities, including Pell City, Alabama, which has a population of over 13,600, and Noble, Oklahoma, where nearly 7,600 people live. Maggers said, quote, Someone in that community might have to drive an hour or an hour and a half to get supplied if they want to go hunting, for instance. Our grocery stores, they wanted to be able to offer their customer another category that they felt like would be popular. End of quote. Wow. So there you go. It isn't enough that you can buy. You used to be able to buy ammunition at Meyer. I don't know if you still can or not. I think they might have done away with that, at least in most Meyer stores. But 20 years ago, you could go buy ammunition. I think you could buy hunting rifles from Meyer at one point in time. Uh, Walmart, you can still buy ammunition there. Um, I know it's available up here in Michigan, so I don't know. As much as I do support the Second Amendment because we do have tyrannists trying to get in the government, I don't know if vending machines dispensing ammunition is the way to go. I I could see somebody breaking into one of those vending machines pretty easily and just stealing all the ammo. So there goes your accountability there. I don't know. You know, and that's because of break-ins at regular retail stores. We have a, a small retail chain in Michigan called Family Farm and Home. One of their stores was broken into a couple of years ago and a lot of guns and I believe some ammo was stolen from the store. And I don't think they've recovered all the firearms from that store either. It might have, I'm, I'm not sure. I know some were recovered. That stuff you got to keep locked up under lock and key. You really do because if somebody breaks in, there you go. They, they're, they've got access to it. And that's the same with these machines. Although I haven't seen one, so I don't know what the security features are on it. That that ought to be something that we need to check out. 
Uh, right now, let's go ahead to our next story here. This is Meg Kennard writing for the Associated Press. This is dated July 10th. A lot of people have been calling for Joe Biden to drop out of the race. Voters have. Some members of Congress have. Fundraise, some fundraisers have. Listen to this one. This is the newest to the list. Movie star and lifelong Democrat George Clooney added his voice to calls for Joe Biden to leave the presidential race on Wednesday, just weeks after headlining a fundraiser that brought in a record single-night haul for the president's re-election campaign. Clooney said in a New York Times opinion piece that he loves Biden, but the party would lose the presidential race as well as any control in Congress with him as the nominee. Clooney wrote this, quote, this isn't only my opinion, this is the opinion of every senator and congress member and governor that I've spoken with in private, end of quote. He's hosted several high-dollar Hollywood fundraisers, including for Biden, last month. Clooney argued the party should pick a new nominee at his convention next month, saying the process would be messy, but wake up voters in the party's favor, mentioning Vice President Kamala Harris and Governors Wes Moore of Maryland Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan, and Gavin Newsom of California, among those from who the country should now hear. Focusing much of his piece around Biden's age, Clooney noted differences he saw in the 81-year-old president during the recent Los Angeles event compared to years past. Clooney wrote, quote, It's devastating to say it, but the Joe Biden I was with three weeks ago at the fundraiser was not the Joe big effing deal Biden of 2010. He wasn't even the Joe Biden of 2020. He was the same man we all witnessed at the debate. End of quote. Last month, Clooney, Julia Roberts, and Barbara Streisand were among those who took the stage for a fundraiser that took in a record $30 million plus for Biden in hopes of energizing would-be supporters for a White House contest they said may rank among the most consequential in U.S. history. It doesn't rank. It is. Number one with a bullet. Pun slightly intended. Clooney isn't alone in his characterization of his recent exchange with Biden. A person who interacted closely with Biden described the president as vibrant and engaging at a fundraiser in March, but at the Los Angeles event months later, said they noticed a notable diminishment in Biden's presence. The person who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss private interactions with the president recalled being struck by how tired and out of it the president seemed during backstage conversations at the Los Angeles event, adding that they gave Biden the benefit of the doubt for not being as valuable and showing lower energy off stage because he arrived in Los Angeles after traveling from Italy where he had attended an international summit. Luminaries from the entertainment world have increasingly lined up to help Biden's campaign. Leading up to the fundraiser, Clooney's name appeared on numerous fundraising missives from the campaign, which he called the fight of our lives. Representatives for Clooney did not immediately return a message seeking comment on insight into his decision when precisely he had made it or how recently he had spoken with Biden. Biden has refused to end his re-election bid after his weak debate performance against presumptive Republican nominee Donald Trump on June 27th. Well, I tell you what, I was talking with a dear friend of mine who's hoping to be uh, guest hosting on the show uh, a little in a couple of months. And that person says it's time for Biden to go. And I'm in a tendency to agree. Joe Biden is 81 years old. It's obvious that he no longer has the mental acuity. There's also talk about whether or not President Biden has Parkinson's disease or the early onset of Parkinson's. Whether that has occurred or not, that's the business of the president and his doctors. But it's also the business of us, we the people. We need to have a president who is going to be there for us. We've already experienced this once before with Ronald Reagan when Reagan was having Alzheimer's disease and pretty much Nancy ran the White House the second term of Reagan's presidency. We've already gone through this before. We don't need to go through it again. It's time for President Biden to step down. Now, who should step up? I've heard several different scenarios. I've heard Gavin Newsom's name. 
I've heard Wes Moore's name. I've heard Gretchen Whitmer's name. I've heard Kamala Harris should be elevated to the top of the ticket. Hell, I even heard a good one. Unify the party. Kamala Harris, president. Bernie Sanders, vice president. I would go for that. I'd love to see a lot of Bernie's ideas implemented. Because they haven't been in the past. They say they have, but they really they haven't. Other than lowering the drug costs for uh, some inhalers and for insulin, yeah. But that could go away if Trump gets in and probably will go away with Project 2025. You folks really need to read it. It's not scaremongering. We're telling the truth. You need to read the document. You need to understand what's in there. Cuts for Social Security, cuts for Medicare, cuts for Medicaid, the doing away of the Environmental Protection Agency, the doing away with the NOAA, the weather people, because they don't want climate change studied. Oh, my God, we can't have climate change. Climate change is, a fic- is fiction. No, hogwash. Climate change is fiction. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Republicans want to do. They want to deregulate everything and pollute this planet, and they don't care because it's all about the money for them, and it's all about the power for them. You need to figure this out, folks. You need to read Project 2025, and it needs to scare the hell out of you. Don't say, oh, it's just a bunch of fiction. It's never going to happen in this country. Yeah, that's what they said in Germany back in the 1930s. And then it did happen. And people turned their blind eye to it. And 6 million Jews died. 20 million people killed between the gypsies, the Jews, the Catholics, gay people, you name it. Anybody that was not blonde hair and blue eyed, that was it. It really was. So... I don't know what to tell you, folks. The This is the second coming of Mein Kampf, and you better be on top of things. And make sure you vote in November. You, you need to vote. I'm going to get my primary ballot because we have a primary vote coming up in August. So I need to get that and get started on filling in the little circles. All right, let's get to our next story here. This is Lindsay Whitehurst writing for the Associated Press. This is dated July 9th out of Washington. Listen to this story. A member of Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor's security detail shot an armed man during an attempted carjacking in the early morning hours, according to court documents. It happened as two deputy U.S. marshals were on duty in a government car in Washington, D.C. about 1 a.m. on July 5th. They were confronted by a man who got out of a silver minivan and pointed a gun at one of them through the driver's side window, according to a criminal complaint. The car was unmarked, but the pair were dressed in U.S. Marshal's shirts. The deputy pulled out his department-issued gun and shot the man about four times, hitting him in the mouth. He then gave the man first aid while the minivan drove away, charges state. The suspect was hospitalized and placed under arrest on suspicion of attempted carjacking and resisting officers. Well, that's going to be a Darwin Award, or it could have been if the guy died. Yeah, walk up to the car. Oh, you're wearing Marshall shirts. Oh, never mind. Jeez, idiot. A spokeswoman for the U.S. Marshals confirmed the deputies were part of the detail protecting Supreme Court justices. The deputies were stationed near Sotomayor's home. Sotomayor was not directly mentioned in court documents, and there's no indication she was the target of the attack. It comes after a string of high-profile carjackings in the nation's capital last year. Other victims included a diplomat from the United Arab Emirates and U.S. Representative Henry Quaylar of Texas. Yeah, that's the one that needs it. (laughs) And he's going bye-bye. (laughs) He, <laughs> no, no more. I'm, I'm really sick of it. And I've said it before on the show, the democratic party needs to purge all the pro-lifers out of the party. They need to purge them period. End of story. Oh, but we're a big tent. We're a big tent, big tent. My ass. 
We need to stop being a big tent because that's what's killing us in the voting. Morons, figure it out. Secret Service agents protecting President Joe Biden's granddaughter also opened fire after three people tried to break into an unmarked Secret Service vehicle last year. No one was struck. The overall number of carjackings is on the decline so far this year, according to police data. So there you go, folks. Interesting. Yeah. That ought to be a uh, uh, off-the-cuff story. Try to carjack. <laughs> Try to carjack a U.S. Marshal's undercover car. Dumb. Oh well, criminals are usually pretty stupid. So what do you expect? All right, let's get to our next story here. This is Sylvie Corbett and Nicholas Garriga writing for the Associated Press. This is dated July 10th out of Paris. The leftist coalition that won the most seats in France's National Assembly in surprise results demanded on Tuesday the immediate right to form a government even though no grouping won a majority of seats. It is unprecedented in France's modern history to have a fractured parliament. Sunday's vote raised the risk of paralysis for the European Union's second largest economy. The legislature is split between the new popular front leftist coalition, President Emmanuel Macron's centrist allies, and the far-right national rally. Macron on Monday asked his Prime Minister Gabriel Attal to continue handling day-to-day -day affairs despite Attal's offer of resignation less than three weeks before the start of the Paris Olympics. Macron leaves Wednesday for a NATO summit in Washington, which took place uh, uh, on Wednesday, as just mentioned here. Um, we might get to that if we have time. Uh, the leftist coalition's three main parties, the hard left France unbowed, the Socialists and the Greens began negotiations to find a candidate for prime minister. The coalition in a statement called on Macron to, quote, immediately turn to the new popular front, end of quote, and allow it to form a government. It said the prolonged retention of Atal could be seen as an attempt to erase the election results. The statement said, quote, we solemnly warn the president of the republic against any attempts to hijack the institutions. If the president continues to ignore the results, it will amount to betrayal of our constitution and a coup against democracy, which we will strongly oppose, end of quote. The leftist coalition includes France's former socialist president, Francois Hollande, who has made an unexpected comeback on the political stage as one of the most prominent candidates in the election, winning a seat in his hometown. He's seen as a key player but didn't speak to journalists as he joined fellow members of the Socialist Party. Green lawmaker Cyrielle Chatelaine said that the new popular front, quote, is the leading Republican force in this country and it is therefore its responsibility to form a government to implement the public policies expected by the French people, end of quote. Talks within the leftist coalition are complicated by internal divisions now that the goal for its hurried formation in recent days, keeping the far right from power in France, has been achieved. Some are pushing for a hard-left figure for prime minister, while others closer to the center-left prefer a more consensual personality. France's prime minister is accountable to parliament and can be ousted through a no-confidence vote. Hard-left lawmaker Matilda Peña said, quote, France unbowed lawmakers are going into the National Assembly not as an opposition force, but as a force that intends to govern the country, end of quote. The top negotiator for the Socialist Party, Johanna Rolland, said the future prime minister won't be Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the divisive hard-left founder of France unbowed who has angered many moderates. Mélenchon, who did not run in the legislative elections, joined the talks at the National Assembly. Speaking on France 2 television, Roland suggested the leftist coalition would work with center-left members of Macron's alliance. Some were accepting the need to make deals and get along. Yael braun Pivet, a member of Macron's centrist alliance and former president of the National Assembly, said, quote, In my view, the French people sent us a clear message. They did not want to give an absolute majority to any specific political bloc, so they're ordering us to listen to one another, work together, and that's what we need to do. End of quote. According to official results, all three main blocks fell far short of the 289 seats needed to control the 577-seat National Assembly, the more powerful of France's two legislative chambers. 
The results showed just over 180 seats for the new Popular Front, more than 160 for Macron's centrist alliance, and more than 140 for the far-right National Rally Party of Marine Le Pen. Macron is three years remaining in his presidential term. So that's what's happening in France. Marine Le Pen is basically France's version of Donald Trump. That's just the bottom line, period, end of story to that. The far right party there is wanting to get rid of, guess what? All the foreigners. Oh, we can't have migration into this country. We need to get rid of all the migrants. A uh, very racist attitude, much like Donald Trump and all of his ilk. <laughs> oh, God. Ilk. And that's what people say when they see Trump coming. Ilk. Or more than likely, they go. <laughs> there you go. Makes me want to throw up listening to that. Anyway, let's go ahead to our next story here. This is Dave Collins writing for the Associated Press. This is dated July 3rd. This is some good news. Very good news. Two stories about Rudy Giuliani coming up. The first one, Rudy Giuliani's creditors, including two former Georgia election workers who won a $148 million defamation judgment against him, are opposing his attempt to convert his bankruptcy into a liquidation, saying they'll likely ask that the case be thrown out instead because of what they call his flouting of bankruptcy laws. The comments came Wednesday during a status hearing on Zoom before U.S. bankruptcy judge Sean Lane in White Plains, New York. The former New York mayor and Donald Trump advisor filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy reorganization in December, Days after the former election workers, Ruby Freeman and her daughter, Wandrea Shea Moss, won their defamation case. They said Giuliani's targeting of them because of Trump's lies about the 2020 election being stolen led to death threats that made them fear for their lives. Philip Dublin, a lawyer for a committee of Giuliani's creditors, and Rachel Strickland, an attorney for Freeman and Moss, accused Giuliani of failing to turn over financial documents, ignoring bankruptcy court orders, and trying to delay the process through litigation tactics. They said they'll likely ask that the bankruptcy case be dismissed at another hearing on July 10th, and we haven't heard anything about that. So I don't know if that happened or not. Dublin said about Giuliani, quote, Our view is we do not have a good faith debtor. He has misbehaved every step of the way. We think again that the debtor here has been trying to game the system. End of quote. Strickland added, quote, For the last six months, my clients in the committee have been sounding alarm bells about Mr. Giuliani's problematic conduct, including his underhanded litigation tactics. We think that the conversion request to liquidation just underscores the bad faith approach and don't think that this is a party that should be allowed to exploit the bankruptcy process any longer. End of quote. Giuliani's bankruptcy lawyer, Gary Fishoff, did not directly address those allegations in court and did not immediately return a message seeking comment after the hearing. He told the judge that Giuliani has the right to convert the case to a Chapter 7 liquidation. If his case is converted to a liquidation which Giuliani requested on Monday, a trustee would be appointed to take control of his assets and sell many of them off to help pay creditors. If it is dismissed, Freeman and Moss could bring their effort to collect on the $148 million award back to the court in Washington, D.C., where they won their lawsuit and avoid having to pay more legal fees for bankruptcy court. Freeman and Moss, meanwhile, have a pending request before the judge to declare that the $148 million judgment cannot be discharged or dismissed during Giuliani's bankruptcy. The bankruptcy is part of the legal quagmire that Giuliani is in across the country. On Tuesday, the former federal prosecutor was disbarred as an attorney in New York after a court found that he repeatedly made false statements about Trump's 2020 election loss. We'll get to that story in just a little bit. Giuliani is also facing the possibility of losing his law license in Washington. A board in May recommended that he be disbarred, though a court has the final say. In Georgia and Arizona, Giuliani is facing criminal charges over his role in the effort to overturn the 2020 election. He has pleaded not guilty in both cases. When he filed for bankruptcy, Giuliani listed nearly $153 million in existing or potential debts, including almost $1 million in state and federal tax liabilities, money he owes lawyers, and many millions of dollars in potential judgments and lawsuits against him. 
He estimated he had assets worth $1 million to $10 million. In his most recent financial filings in the bankruptcy case, he said he had about $94,000 cash in hand at the end of May, while his company, Giuliani Communications, had about $237,000 in the bank. The main source of income for Giuliani over the past two years has been a retirement account with a balance of just over a million dollars in May, down from nearly $2.5 million in 2022 after his withdrawals, the filings say. In May, he spent nearly $33,000, including nearly $28,000 for condo and co-op costs for his Florida and New York City homes. He also spent about $850 on food, $390 on cleaning services, $230 on medicine, $200 on laundry, and $190 on vehicles. So there you go. Giuliani living beyond his means. He needs to have his budget trimmed down a lot. <laughs> Maybe he should go on the Dave Ramsey plan. <laughs> Dave Ramsey. Ugh, oh, 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 I hate saying that name. Oh, Dave Ramsey, multiple time douchebag of the week winner on this show. Oh my gosh. Because he's another conservative nut job. All right, let's go ahead to the next story about Giuliani. This is Philip Marcello writing for the Associated Press. This is dated July 2nd out of New York. Rudy Giuliani, the former New York City mayor, federal prosecutor, and legal advisor to Donald Trump, was disbarred in New York on Tuesday after a court found he repeatedly made false statements about Trump's 2020 election loss. The Manhattan Appeals Court ruled Giuliani, who had his New York law license suspended in 2021 for making false statements around the election, is no longer allowed to practice law in the state effective immediately. The decision read this way, quote, the seriousness of respondents' misconduct cannot be overstated, end of quote. Giuliani flagrantly misused his position and baselessly attacked and undermined the integrity of this country's electoral process. Again, that's part of the decision. The court wrote, quote, in doing so, respondent not only deliberately violated some of the most fundamental tenets of the legal profession, but he also actively contributed to the national strife that has followed the 2020 presidential election for which he is entirely unrepentant, end of quote. Giuliani said Tuesday that he wasn't surprised to lose his law license in his hometown, claiming in a post on the social media platform X that the case was, quote, based on an activist complaint replete with false arguments, end of quote. Really? There you go. The former mob prosecutor was admitted to the New York bar in 1969, but before pleading Trump's case in November 2020, Giuliani had not appeared in court as an attorney since 1992, according to court records. Giuliani spokesperson Ted Goodman said the man once dubbed America's mayor will appeal the objectively flawed decision by the mid-level state court. He also called on others in the legal community to speak out against the, quote, politically and ideologically corrupted decision, end of quote. <laughs> Giuliani's attorney, Arthur Idala was more measured, saying his legal team was obviously disappointed but not surprised by the decision. He said they, quote, put up a valiant effort, end of quote, to prevent the disbarment, but, quote, saw the writing on the wall, end of quote. Giuliani argued in hearings held last October that he believed the claims he was making on behalf of the Trump campaign were true, but the court, in its decision, said it wasn't convinced. The decision read in part, quote, Contrary to respondents' allegations, there is nothing on the record before us that would permit the conclusion that respondent lacked knowledge of the falsehood of the numerous statements that he made and that he had a good faith basis to believe them to be true, end of quote. Among other things, the court said it found that Giuliani, quote, falsely and dishonestly, end of quote, claimed during the 2020 presidential election that thousands of votes were cast in the names of dead people in Philadelphia including a ballot in the name of the late boxing great Joe Frazier. He also falsely claimed people were taken from nearby Camden, New Jersey, to vote illegally in the Pennsylvania city, the court said. The decision ad, uh, read this way, quote, These false statements were made to improperly bolster response, respondents' narrative 
that due to widespread voter fraud, victory in the 2020 United States presidential election was stolen from his client, end of quote. The disbarment comes amid mounting woes for the 80-year-old Giuliani. In May, WABC Radio suspended him and canceled his daily talk show because he refused to stop making false claims about the 2020 election. Giuliani is also facing the possibility of losing his law license in Washington. A board in May recommended that he be disbarred, though a court has the final say. He also filed for bankruptcy last year after being ordered to pay $148 million in damages to two former Georgia election workers over lies he spread about them that upended their lives with racist threats and harassment. We just mentioned that story just a few minutes ago. Giuliani on Monday asked a federal judge to convert his bankruptcy case from a reorganization to a liquidation, which would mean most of his assets would be sold off to help pay what he owes creditors. And we already mentioned all that. Uh, we also mentioned that Giuliani is also facing criminal charges in Georgia and Arizona over his role in the effort to overturn the 2020 election. He has pleaded not guilty in both cases. He's charged in Georgia with making false statements and soliciting false testimony, conspiring to create phony paperwork and asking state lawmakers to violate their oath of office to appoint an alternative slate of pro-Trump electors. The Arizona indictment accuses Giuliani of pressuring Maricopa County officials and state legislators to change the outcome of Arizona's results and encouraging Republican electors in the state to vote for Trump in December 2020. Giuliani built his public persona by practicing law as the top federal prosecutor in Manhattan in the 1980s when he went after mobsters, power brokers, and others. The law and order reputation helped catapult him into politics governing the United States' most populous city when it was beset by high crime. The Republican was lauded for holding the city together after the September 11th terror attacks when two hijacked planes slammed into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, killing more than 2,700 people. But after unsuccessful runs for the U.S. Senate and the presidency and a lucrative career as a globetrotting consultant, Giuliani smashed his image as a centrist who could get along with Democrats as he became one of Trump's most loyal defenders. He was the primary mouthpiece for Trump's false claims of election fraud after the 2020 vote, infamously standing at a press conference in front of Four Seasons Total Landscaping outside Philadelphia, saying the campaign would challenge what he claimed was a vast conspiracy by Joe Biden and fellow Democrats. Lies around the election results helped push an angry mob of pro-Trump rioters to storm the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, in an effort to stop the certification of Biden's victory. So, good news, Giuliani disbarred. Bye-bye, Rudy. Bye-bye. All right, let's get to our next story. Stop! Hammer time! Oh, yeah, it's hammer time. It's time to drop the hammer on the douchebag of the week. This week, we have a corporate award to give to Tractor Supply Company. I have this story. This is Wyatt Grantham Phillips and Hallelujah Hadero writing for the Associated Press. This is dated July 2nd out of New York City. The National Black Farmers Association called on Tractor Supply's president and CEO Tuesday to step down after the rural retailer announced that it would drop most of its corporate diversity and climate advocacy efforts. The resignation demand emerged as Tractor Supply, which sells products ranging from farming equipment to pet supplies, faces a deepening backlash over its decision, which itself came after conservative activists spoke out against the company's work to be more socially inclusive and to curb climate change. In a public announcement last week, the company said it would eliminate all of its diversity, equity, and inclusion roles and sponsorships of non-business activities like Pride Festivals and withdraw its goals for reducing carbon emissions. Critics of the new position argue that Tractor Supply is giving in to hate and harming its customers by abandoning crucial principles. John Boyd Jr., president and founder of the National Black Farmers Association, said in an interview, quote, I was appalled by the decision. I see this as rolling back the clock with race relations because the country is so divided on race, especially in rural America, end of quote. Tractor Supply declined to comment further when reached on Tuesday. The company, which has its headquarters in Brentwood, Tennessee, you know who else is in Brentwood, Tennessee? Dave Ramsey. 
operates over 2,200 stores across the United States, most of them located in rural areas. The retailer's core customer base consists of shoppers in need of farm and ranch products such as livestock feed, trucking supplies, tools, and outdoor equipment. Boyd said tractor supply stores can be found where much of NBFA's 130,000 members are located. Like other farmers, he said black farmers have shopped at the chain for years. Boyd, who is also a tractor supply shareholder, estimated personally spending more than $10,000 at his local store since January alone, buying supplies like fencing wire and feed for his cattle and horses in Virginia. Before the company's announcement, conservative activists opposed to DEI efforts, sponsorship of LGBTQ plus events, and climate advocacy had spent weeks criticizing tractor supply on social media. Tractor Supply said in its Thursday statement that it was making the changes after hearing from disappointed customers and, quote, took this feedback to heart, end of quote. The decision marked a significant shift in messaging from Tractor Supply, which once touted its diversity and inclusion efforts. In recent years, the company has been trying to broaden its appeal to younger customers, including former city dwellers it is at risk of now alienating. The company said, quote, we will continue to listen to our customers and team members. Your trust and confidence in us are of the utmost importance, and we don't take that lightly, end of quote. NBFA said it had made repeated attempts to discuss its concerns with Tractor Supply President and CEO Hal Lawton before calling for his resignation. Boyd said, quote, he's gone too far, and we have to let him know that we're not going to sit back and take this mess anymore, end of quote. Boyd added that the organization may consider calling for a boycott of tractor supply if nothing changes in the coming days. Quote, we're tired of being mistreated by the government and Fortune 500 companies. Black farmers are going to start fighting back, and that's what we're doing. End of quote. Some customers already have decided to take their business elsewhere, including Squirrelwood Equine Sanctuary, a New York animal sanctuary that says it spends more than $65,000 annually on livestock feed and other supplies at Tractor Supply. Squirrelwood co-founder Beth Hyman said she first heard about the company's decision when the sanctuary supporters reached out to ask if the group planned to make a statement about it. She thought about it for a day and then went to her local store to ask a manager whom she's worked with for years about the announcement. Hyman, who is gay, says she told the manager the sanctuary can no longer support Tractor Supply if its announcement reflected its beliefs. The sanctuary also posted its stance on X, where the post has received 31,000 likes. Hyman said, quote, it's mind-boggling to me that a company would cave to basically a hate campaign. Now they just have another boycott on their hands. We didn't call for that, but obviously people are, end of quote. Yeah, and I'm one of them. Don't go to Tractor Supply. Go elsewhere. Alan Adamson, co-founder of marketing consultancy Megaforce, said the conservative pressure on Tractor Supply and the fallout from giving in was the, quote, perfect example of how the increasingly split in the country politically and ideologically have made it really hard to run consumer-facing businesses. No matter which way you go on this, you're going to upset big chunks of customers, end of quote. Consumers of all backgrounds are becoming more influenced by social media and choosing to redirect their spending if they feel like companies don't align with their values, Adamson said. He added that with the case of Tractor Supply, whose business is tethered to rural communities, anti-DEI activism put the retailer, quote, in a really tricky, end of quote, situation where it had to do something to stop a potential exodus. Adamson added, quote, no company wants to be a target of negativity on social media. It's a no-win situation, end of quote. Tractor Supplies Reversal follows boycott campaigns against Bud Light and Target last year over their LGBTQ plus marketing. Target decided not to carry Pride Month merchandise in all its stores this June following last year's backlash. Legal attacks against companies' diversity and inclusion efforts have also drawn more attention following the Supreme Court's 2023 ruling to end affirmative action in college admissions. Many conservative and anti-DEI activists have been seeking to set a similar precedent in the working world. A handful of other organizations and patrons of Tractor Supply have also expressed disappointment or outrage over the company's recent announcement which included plans to no longer submit data to the Human Rights Campaign, the largest advocacy group for LGBTQ plus rights in the U.S. 
Eric Bloom, Vice President of Programs and Corporate Advocacy at the Human Rights Campaign, said in a statement last week that Tractor Supply is, quote, turning its back on their own neighbors with a short-sighted decision, end of quote. The organization had worked with Tractor Supply to create inclusive pro policies and practices for years, he added. But Boyd of the National Black Farmers Association said despite years-long efforts from the NBFA, Tractor Supply did not consult the group on past diversity and inclusion goals or participate in the organization's conferences. The company recently invited NBFA to apply to be a partner of Tractor Supply's company foundation, but the organization learned on June 26, one day before Tractor Supply's announcement, on its DEI and climate goals that it was not among the groups selected. So there you go, folks. So to Tractor Supply Company, we have this message for you. Don't be a douchebag. Yeah, that's right. Hey, you need to stop caving into these evil, violent, conservative traitors. They're loud, but they're not going to get anything accomplished. They need to have their mouths shut. All right, let's get to our final story here. This is Paul Wiseman writing for the Associated Press. This is dated July 10th out of Washington. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell on Wednesday reinforced a message that the Fed is paying growing attention to a slowing job market and not only to taming inflation, a shift that signals it's likely to begin cutting interest rates soon. Powell told the House Financial Services Committee on the second of two days of semi-annual testimony to Congress, quote, we're not just an inflation-targeting central bank, we also have an employment mandate, end of quote. On Tuesday, when Powell addressed the Senate Banking Committee, he suggested that the Fed had made considerable progress toward its goal of defeating the worst inflation spike in four decades and noted that cutting rates, quote, too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment, end of quote. Congress has given the Fed a dual mandate to keep prices stable and to promote maximum employment. Powell said Wednesday, quote, for a long time we've had to focus on the inflation mandate, end of quote. As the economy roared out of the pandemic recession, inflation hit a four-decade high in mid-2022. The Fed responded by raising its benchmark rate 11 times in 2022 and 2023. Inflation has since plummeted from its 9.1% peak to 3.3%. The U.S. economy and job market have continued to grow, defying widespread predictions that much higher borrowing costs resulting from the Fed's rake heights would cause a recession. Still, growth has weakened this year. From April through June, U.S. employers have added an average 177,000 jobs a month, the lowest three-month hiring pace since January 2021. Powell told the House panel on Wednesday that to avoid damaging the economy, the Fed likely wouldn't wait until inflation reached its 2% target before it would start cutting rates. More economists have said they expect the Fed's first rate cut to occur in September. Powell this week has declined to say when he envisions the first cut. Under questioning from several Republican lawmakers, Powell said the Fed and other financial regulators will overhaul a 2023 proposal known as the Basel III Endgame, that would raise the amount of capital the banks are required to hold against potential losses. Large banks have aggressively fought against the stricter requirements which emerged after the aftermath of the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis. They have warned that the tighter rules would force them to cut lending to consumers and businesses, potentially imperiling the economy. Powell said the three main U.S. bank regulators, the Fed, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, we're near agreement on a new version that would be subject to public comment. So we could be seeing some rate cuts here in the near future from the Fed. That would be good news for the economy. Well, folks, that's it for this week. We'll be back next week. I'm Darren Gibson for Southpaws. Please support independent media, the First Amendment, and a woman's right to choose. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved.